Welcome to the spring lecture series. It's going to be really, really amazing. We've got a series of great speakers coming over the next few weeks. Details will need to follow. Um, it's sort of a different format to this lecture series and the underlying theme of resilience, which is the whole school project. I'll pass over to Mike. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm just going to explain really quickly um, why why the lectures are slightly different this term, and also uh, introduce our speakers, um, Jonathan and Peter. Um, so the, the format of the lectures this term is slightly different, um, and kind of a bit more formal than we have traditionally done kind of with SOAS. Uh, and this is coming up a collaboration with the Building Resilience Platform and the Agency Research Group at SSOA. So approached us with the offer to collaboratively, collaboratively organise the lectures this term. Um, these have traditionally been um, with the sorry with the school forum. These have traditionally been separate lecture activities with the school forum running on Tuesdays and the side lectures running on Thursdays. However, there was a feeling of oversaturation of guest speakers at this time of year. Um, and in order to mitigate this, we've worked together to organise one set of lectures for Thursday evenings. Um, and it's also given us the opportunity to pull our resources to an entry of speakers we wouldn't historically have had access to as a student society to be invited to share their work and research with us. And this is, of course, very resilient, which is the kind of theme for this term. Um, so now I'm just going to quickly introduce uh, Peter and Jonathan to you from the Goodwin Development Trust. Um, so Peter is a serial entrepreneur and the CEO of the Development Trust. Peter has led the growth of a small community enterprise to one of the country's most successful development trusts with a turnover of 12 million, over 300 staff and 150 active volunteers. Goodman's diverse interests include childcare, education, training, social care, media, transport, food and sport, and it has recently moved into the field of social housing and is building an innovative carbon neutral social, social housing development. It has designed, painted, and um, marketing the Oxypod, a device that directly addresses fuel poverty by providing up to 30% saving on heating bills. Um, so that's Peter. And then Jonathan. Uh, so Jonathan, John Wilson is the uh, capital project manager working in the heart of the Goodwin Development Trust, underpinned by a successful education in architecture. Jonathan has developed a realistic vision for regeneration, design, and innovative architecture providing real projects in the real world for real people. Jonathan is driven by a determination to improve and develop communities through a positive and progressive delivery approach to capital and business development. All associated aims and objectives strive to build and craft a new perspective to people and places in need of regeneration and renewal. By delivering a hands-on approach to architecture, design and communication, Jonathan has continued his career in the innovative hands of Goodwin Development Trust, which openly encourages and puts in practice original ideas, working with multi multidisciplinary projects and designs. There we go. So I'm going to hand over to um, Peter. Thank you. Save it for the end. Is this, is this a touch screen? Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, as I understand it, you're all architecture students here, um, uh, which is always a slight challenge, speaking to a room full of people who are all disciplined uh, in one particular view of the world. Um, uh, opening slide, John. Um, the last time I actually got to speak uh, to architects was about four or five years ago. I got invited to a Reba event. And it was the, the event was around Vitruvius, and the person who invited me had the arrogance to send me my speaker's brief in Latin, um, which didn't actually dispose me very well to Reba going forward. And, and I decided to respond by you know, putting the title of my presentation in Latin that day and asked if there were any classic students in the audience, and they weren't, and they didn't understand the Latin title. Uh, I don't know, so I've used the title again. And I've used it a lot since, because whilst the title started as a sort of slight irritation with Reba and its arrogance, actually the more I've used the title, the more it actually does explain exactly what we as an organisation are about and exactly what we do. Do we have any classic students in the audience? No. Anybody want to make a stab at what these three words mean? Come on, this is a chalk and talk. This is an interactive experience. Yeah. Yeah. People. Power. 
And actually, this is a word that does get used in the English language, particularly in Scotland. There's a, there's a public office in Scotland called the Procurator Fiscal. Yeah. Procurator is a sort of quite a complicated concept in Latin. Procurator is, is almost agency, it's having a sense of care for a place. And actually, the more I've thought about what we do and as an organisation, we've been doing it for about 20 years now, and it's our 20th anniversary. Actually, yeah, we're definitely about people. We definitely negotiate power yeah, in all sorts of areas of the work that we do. And actually, the most complex and difficult thing is articulating this idea of having a care for a place and somehow having some collective responsibility for the place and the community that we inhabit. Yeah. Goodwin Development Trust started 20 years ago. It's uh, started by a group of tenants and residents of a small, insignificant inner city housing estate in Hull. Um, this guy here, Tony Deering, was one of our founder members. It's the earliest photograph we managed to find of our organisation. These are two PhD students from Bristol University um, who were up studying poverty in the north. There is that endless fascination between students and northern poverty and, and, and the academic interest in it. And I think this study was filed with about the other 20 that we had done on the shelf and ignored henceforth. John? And this is where we are. Um, yeah, quite difficult to point to anything that's of any particular architectural <coughs> interest. Although as we were coming in, John tells me that a lot of 60s concrete tower blocks have now been, have now been listed and have been protected. So maybe eventually our time will come. Uh, one of the reasons I put this up, that uh, it's an apocryphal story, but I believe it to be the case, that Hull was the, the town that built the last multi-storey tower block in England. This went up in 1982. I think at that point Leeds had already started pulling them down. In Hull, we were still building them. So we're a small inner city community. This is the Humber River here. Um, we're a community of 5,000 people. An awful lot of that population lives in the area in tower blocks. It's entirely comprised of social housing. Uh, and it's an estate in a town that sort of lost its way and its reason to be. Hull, for those who don't know it, was a town that fished. The only reason Hull exists is because when you head in that direction, there's the North Sea, and there used to be a lot of fish. Somewhere about the end of the 70s, that whole thing stopped. And as a single industry community, Hull struggled, really, to find its way. Uh, and despite the ups and downs in the economy over the intervening 40 years, it's never managed to do much other than bump around at the bottom. What do we do? Uh, this was... One of the things we did, probably seven or eight years ago now, given the last picture of yeah, dull architectural buildings, we felt that having managed to pull together the resources to invest in a new community building, rather than building something out of breeze block and wiggly tin, we wanted to make a statement about our community and actually raise that sense of aspiration in a community about the quality of the public realm and buildings uh, and what we do is try and talk to our community so we don't do things to our community we do things with our community and this building came about as a result of a four-year community audit that we carried out um, we happened upon a, a methodology that's used in latin america called participant rural appraisal where communities self-audit what's good about their community and what's bad about the community, what works and what doesn't work. This building was an expression of some of the aspirations of our community. 5,000 people we didn't have a GP, 5,000 people we didn't have any childcare, 5,000 people we had no location for public services on the estate. So this building became a home for all of those functions and it also generated income for the trust and the community and on the top floor we put in a large conference centre which started to change the way the estate operated by building a conference centre in the middle of a rundown council estate 
we started to create traffic. We started to create traffic both onto the estate and off the estate. And that started to create dialogue and interaction between people who would never previously have thought about coming into our estate and started to change the perception of residents who would never have perceived their estate as being a destination for people. So the activities we engage in, the organisation was set up ostensibly to improve the quality of life. We've never actually we've never actually developed beyond that single initial aspiration. But what we have done is, is learned that actually allowing yourself to think about what the quality of life is for a community of 5,000 people does allow you a lot of latitude for areas of operation. A significant part of the work we do on the estate is with children and families. Um, a significant part of it is with young people. The estate has happened to be caught up in the backwash of a declining economy at the end of the 70s and never recovered. Unemployment is a huge blight uh, up in Hull and in our community. So actually creating employment and trading has been absolutely central to what we do. Uh, this bunch of lads here uh, were involved in the conversion of an abandoned pub. So when we let building contracts, we work with our contractors to ensure there's an opportunity to create trading and employment for people who live on the estate. The other bit of the estate and that community that we're actively involved in is elderly and vulnerable. The estate was initially built as part of slum clearance. Huge areas of old terraced housing that we used for the fishing industry were eradicated in the late 50s and early 60s. And people were moved into this new council estate and consisting primarily of tower blocks. It hasn't been a particularly happy experience for most of them, if you ask them. They yearned for a sense of community that they felt they lost. Somewhere it's difficult to nail down what that thing is that they feel they've lost. They clearly have a sense of community. But somewhere there is that itch that they can't quite help but scratch about how it was better when they didn't live in the sky. So our role in actually ensuring that that community feels cohesive and feels part of the community is important. So just jump back one, John, I miss that Yeah, I mean, back to that idea of, of appraising your own community and asking your own community to reflect on what's good, what's bad, and what's needed and what's not needed. By definition of being a poor community, there isn't a lot of profit to be had in it. So that traditional private sector model of selling things to people to make profit doesn't actually work very well in poor communities. Most of our shops on the estate became abandoned a long time ago. Once the private sector leaves town, the public sector tends to leave quite soon afterwards. And you get a community that has an increasing sense of abandonment. What we've done is start to replace those public and private services with community-based services. And that's demanded, us, it demanded of us that we look at new business models. This was a classic example of we had no fresh food shops on the estate. We looked at why we had no fresh food shops, and it was because people couldn't make money. The more we looked at the business model, we couldn't make it make money. The solution was to open a food cooperative. So we held a series of public meetings, we invited people along, we pointed out that if they wanted access to fresh food, they would have to actively involve themselves. So we employ a single member of staff in the shop, but we have a team of 40 or 50 volunteers who volunteer to work in the shop, against which they get a discount against their purchase of fruit and vegetables. That allows us, that different business model, to actually operate and provide services that we wouldn't be able to do. Our local community in Hull changed quite dramatically about five or six years ago. Hull was an incredibly white city, uh, uniquely in England. Not like Sheffield, not like Leeds, not like other metropolitan areas. Hull had no history of immigration uh, from the old British Empire. It was exclusively a white, working class, indigenous city. And geographically, Hull's odd in terms of England. It's an incredibly crowded little island. Hull's 60 miles away from its nearest neighbour, which is Leeds. You can't really go south because there's the largest river estuary in Europe, and north's a long way over some hills, and in the end, you only get to Middlesbrough. 
About five or six years ago, we had a massive influx of migration as a result of a change in refugee policy in this country, and had a huge influx of Kurds from the Middle East, mostly from Iraq, some from Iran, and some from Turkey. And that actually was a huge pressure on us as an organisation. And to some extent, to become comfortable with dealing with our white, indigenous, working class community and raised a whole raft of new cultural issues if we were to say we were actually reflecting our community needs. I mean, almost as an aside, going back to the previous slide about our food cooperative, when we held a series of public meetings asking people to attend to discuss a food cooperative, we had the whole swathe of Iraqi Kurds who turned up, as well as our indigenous population. The indigenous population implicitly assumed that what we were talking about was a retail outlet, which is what we were talking about. The Iraqi Kurds turned up, having seen a poster advertising a, a food cooperative, and assumed we were setting up an agricultural cooperative. And this was a cooperative farm because they came from an agricultural community on the borders of Iraq and Turkey. Almost as a result of that yeah, unexpected consequence, we've turned the field at the back of the building you saw earlier into a, a series of community allotments. And as well as running a food cooperative that retails, we also run a food cooperative that actually grows its own food. This was um, and it's four years ago. I know it's four years ago because the World Cup's come around again this year. This was four years ago, the last World Cup, and we decided that change in the demographics of our community to represent that by having a migrant World Cup in our community. Uh, we managed to find 21 teams of migrants who'd arrived in our community from other countries and organised a World Cup. Uh, believe it or not, this is the Iraqi team, and the Iraqi team won the World Cup. Believe it or not, they played the Kurds in the final. Yeah? The police were very interested. The only, the only said black spot, the only red spot on the whole tournament was a red card that was given to the English captain in the semi-final playoff against Iraq. You couldn't have written it. Uh, so we're doing it again this year. And sometimes not to local communities. Um, this is a picture of the women's committee at a small village in the Gambia. Um, one of our members of staff, probably about eight or nine years ago now, ended up in a pub on a Friday night with him, and he was describing the village he came from in the Gambia, a small village called New Yundum, a village of about 5,000 people, a village that had a sense that it had been abandoned by central government a village that had never had any sense that there was local democracy or local government, a village that had actually learned to rely on itself for its services and its sustainability and its resilience. And the more we drank beer and the more we talked, the more we realised there was a very common narrative here between his experience in a small rural village in the Gambia and our experience in a, in a social housing estate in, north, uh, in, in, in Hull, in the north of England. So we ended up twinning our estate with their village. Not our city with their city, but our estate, our community of 5,000 people with their community of 5,000 people. And have been exchanging people and ideas and experiences for all of those years. Uh, and this was a meeting, as I say, with the Village Women's Committee. Uh, what we've done is raise finance for their micro-enterprise loan fund uh, that they operate over in the Gambia. Um, we look to an exchange project with our young people. Back to those young people that you saw in front of the pub that we, we had on construction industry training courses. The idea is when we get people up and running, we keep them up and running. The problem with poor areas like mine is it isn't simple poverty in economic terms. It tends to be a poverty of aspiration. It tends to be a poverty that says, this is what we've got and we'll put up with it. If we're to do something about the quality of life in our community, if we are to raise expectations, then we need to raise expectations considerably from the low levels we start with. Uh, do you want to do that one, John? Yeah, you do that one later. And I guess this is my board. Yeah, as I said, we've been around for 20 years now. Perhaps, yeah, we, we, 
Uh, we're a successful organization, I think, as, as, uh, as, as your MC said. You know, we, 20 years, we turn around 12 million pounds. We employ 300 people. You know, we sit on about 30 and a half million pounds worth of assets, which, given property prices in Hull, actually ain't bad. Um, the most interesting thing about us as an organization is that we're entirely owned and controlled by a bunch of people who live on a council estate in a failed northern city. It is written into our governing documents, our memorandum and articles of association, that if you wish to be a director of the Goodwin Development Trust, you have to live there. It was probably the single most powerful decision the organization ever, ever made. What that says is that expertise in improving the quality of life in our community is not external to our community, it's internal. The people that know best about what the quality of life of our community means are the people who live there. And for all 20 years, our board of directors, and these are our current board, are people who live within that community of 5,000 people. We were never tempted to have politicians, bank managers, architects, dare I say, accountants, or lawyers on our board. And actually on reflection, yeah, as I said, I think that's the most powerful decision as an organisation we ever took. Because somewhere what it does, it changes a perception of risk. All of these people, by and large, left school at 14 or 15 and were told that yeah, their expectations in life should be limited. Yeah, these people are cleaners, they're people who work in school kitchens, these are people who are taxi drivers. And yet they look after and are legally <coughs> responsible for an organisation with 300 staff and £12 million a year turnover. If you're talking about sustainability, if you're talking about community resilience, then actually this is as good an example of it as you will ever get. Then it wasn't a model that was handed down, it wasn't a model that was developed as a result of academic study, it was a model that was learned through bitter experience, through challenge, through failure in lots of cases, but actually a sense of commitment and worth and a commitment to the community that that community was part of itself. Yeah. Finally, I mean, just some numbers really, and, and to reiterate that point yeah, in terms of growth. Yeah, if we'd be a normal company, a private sector company that had shares and dividends, we would have been very successful. We would have actually made some very rich people as shareholders. What we do is reinvest all our surpluses. We don't have external shareholders. All the profits we generate, and we do generate profits, we're not a not-for-profit company. We're a for-profit company, it's what we do with the profit that counts. So significant amount of growth over the period, but back to that single last line, you know, the most, empower, the most important and powerful statement we have to make, that after 20 years, the fact that this company was started by, <coughs> run by, managed by, strategically directed by the tenants and residents of a, of a housing estate in Central Hull, actually in two, well, it should be 2014 now, it still is. And actually that's a model that bears consideration, it bears reflection, and for you as potential professionals, you know, at some point to leave and end of the real world. Yeah. When you do, if you take nothing else you know, from this talk this evening, take this fact with you, that actually resilience and sustainability in communities is something that communities are inherently good at if given the opportunity to exercise power. And back to that first slide, yeah, this is about people, it is about power, and power needs to be negotiated to get to this point. But actually the important thing was that final third word, which is about having a care for a place. And that place is not just a physical place, it's a community as well. Thank you. Hiya. Uh, I'm Jonathan Wilson, I'm Goodwin's Capital Project Manager. Um, I sort of was one of you not, not too long ago, um, but three years ago I finished my diploma. Um, in my year out, I went um, I worked in London, I worked for West Hills on you know, shopping centres and 
and then went to John Clark's, you know, high end architect, sort of centre of London, did, did the commercial thing, enjoyed it, yeah, it, it, it was fun. Um, but then, as I went on in my first year of my diploma, I came across Goodwin, and they yeah, they offered me an opportunity, um, which was to go out to the Gambia, and it was to go and uh, design a market out there. Um, it was you know, it was it was challenging going to my tutors and saying, you know, I want to go design a market out of Gambia. You know, they're going to pay for to go out to Gambia. Because predominantly, you know, a market out in Gambia is not iconic architecture. It, you know, the design merits you know, uh, are very simple, and you know, it, it was hard to get them to agree for me to go and do that. And the design was very simple, but actually, you know, that process and going out to the Gambia, spending I spent ten days living with a family in the Gambia you know, with a man with four wives, and you know. It, it, it was interesting, to that way. Um, and yeah, we, we designed the market. Um, you know, it was my first opportunity to work with Goodwin, and actually, it changed everything. You know, I, I went from you know, high-end commercial London, enjoyed it, but at the same time, saw a completely different approach to architecture. And I do believe it's architecture. If it, you know, just because it's not, it wasn't iconic doesn't mean it wasn't architecture, it changed, it. It changed a, a place. Um, so that, that sort of bit of background on who I am and what I'm doing here. Um, so, yeah, the question, do, yeah, do we retrofit neighbourhoods, as in does Goodwin? And I yeah, looked at that title and decided what, do we retrofit neighbourhoods up? Yeah, not 100% sure if Goodwin does that, because I, yeah, I think what Goodwin actually does very well is it has, yeah, it has a very natural progression. Over the last 20 years, Goodwin has progressed and there's, you know, there's been a steady increase in you know, all aspects of Goodwin. And I think by retrofitting, you know, there's an argument to say that that's fixing something that's old, something that's failing. And I, I think that what Goodwin has done over the past 20 years, and I've only been with Goodwin for the past three years, is but what, what Goodwin seems to do is it, it seems to manage that progression so you know it, it, it isn't as hard hitting as retrofitting possibly sound. Uh, this is Ken. So Ken was the in house architect when I was doing the Gambia project. Uh, Ken was working at the time on you know, 10 million pounds worth of development. And what, what interests me so much is that Goodwin's approach to architecture, to design, to um, sort of regeneration with capital projects is very different to what I expected and what else is out there in, you know, in, in the world. Is Goodwin employed Ken, full-time architects, in-house in to, to do those projects. And what, what Ken did you know, very well was he was a man on the ground. He, he was part of the community, which gave him, you know, which allowed him to be able to design the correct buildings for the, you know, for the right people in the right places. Um, so the octagon that Peter showed you at the beginning, you know, from, a, from, a, from a purist architect view, you met, you know, a lot of people have different views on that. You know, I'll, I'll be honest and say that it's not one of my favourite looking buildings. But at the same time, I've seen the impact that that, that building has had on, on that neighbourhood. If you'd, if you'd put a purist you know, piece of iconic architecture sat by in the middle of that estate, I don't think it would work. It worked because of Ken, and it worked because Ken knew the community. And he, you know, he used to drink with the community, which is you know, always, always a good thing. And you know, one, of the, one of the things that I remember from Ken, because unfortunately Ken has now passed away, but Ken spent a lot of money and a lot, did a lot of design work for the roof of the octagon. And sort of, you know, when, he, when he explained that to me, he couldn't really understand you know, why he wanted to make the roof of a three-story building beautiful. But actually, it's because it's going back to those tower blocks because you know, there was a, a large number of people on that estate that were looking down onto that building. And 
yeah, that story alone was yeah, another good reason to, for why I'd want to go and work for good in an organisation. Yeah, it's it's not the clear path to an architecture. You know, it it could, got offered jobs, could have very easily gone back to previous jobs, and just gone down you know into an architect's. But actually, I got the bug by that point. You know, by going to Gambia, staying in touch with Goodwin. Um, sort of followed a Brian excellent conversion of a single skin building uh, that was yeah, a Netto building and I followed that whilst I was doing my diploma and by that point I had the bug um, was definitely looking to go down the regeneration um, path and luckily for me um, yeah, opportunities arose at Goodwin um, I originally came in as a consultant straight out of the university um, and worked on yeah, the Youth and Arts Centre and I've, yeah, this was and still is, the, yeah, the big, was the biggest learning curve of the project. It, you know, it's, it's a very simple project really, it's a redundant pub, um, been on Goodwin's books for many years and I've been doing a, a small project with some community gardens and had you know, been working with the community and that was a big you know, it was a big shock for me to go from you know, London to going into a, a shop on an estate dealing with you know, a community that was uh, alien to me I've, I've never never worked with that sort of community but you know, again a big learning curve and it was, I identified the fact that you know, that, that building that used to be a pub that used to be the heart of the community was actually, you know, it, it, it was annoying that community because we bought it, we'd done nothing with it. And actually, you know, I took the idea to Goodwin and that is very much how Goodwin works. It's, I don't get told, you've got to do this, this is what you're doing. You know, we, we, the whole of Goodwin, go out and we find projects. And if those projects stack up, and if there's a need for that project, then, you know, Goodwin, Peter, the board will support that project. There needs to be a need, and that is you know, absolutely clear. So, when when we looked at this building, it, it was a pivotal point in Hull with Goodwin about taking the next step with our youth and, and our arts agenda. And actually, I wrote a, wrote a project, put it put it in front of the board. It stacked up, and we got the green light. Um, so I came to Goodwin really to on a consultancy basis to design, so, you know, sort of relatively simple design, um, but project manage, which was new to me, but again, was, was fully supported by Google. Um, Darley's, yeah, it's opened, and it's, it's, we've won awards from our youth services because yeah, we took that step. It was low cost, you know, we, it, it has AstroTurf on the inside of, instead of carpet, you know, because it was designed with kids, you know, I, sp I spent two or three days sat down with the kids from that estate on the drop-in and actually worked with their parents who came in who drank there and, you know, and it, it works, you know, and it's all the windows in that building, uh, single pane windows, we were told by the police before we opened that we, you know, under no circumstances must we open that building with single pane windows unless they had bars in front and we said no yeah we said yeah if we get broken into we get broken into but actually it was about that community engagement with the kids that are going to use the building who were more than likely the ones that were going to touch the windows if anyone did and it was about working with their parents as well who used to drink there who have you know have an ownership of that building in whichever way you know they want to have but um, and then, you know, sort of following on from, from Darley's, you know, though this, you know, Darley's was at a time where things were tough financially, you know, the, the world was crashing, and Goodwin still invested into capital projects. Um, it, was, it, was a big, yeah, it was a big statement in Hull for Goodwin to do so. And we, you know, what it allowed is it allows me personally to have that, that sort of year programme. For, to get over the, you know, the tough times and whilst yeah, I had that hunger and I wanted to stay with Goodwin Garden Trust and so in, in effect did the same as what I did with Darley's went and looked for an opportunity to find a project to 
to you know to stay in place like Goodwin. And what was what became very apparent was that you know, Goodwin offers all those you know, the services that Peter has just mentioned. But what we didn't deliver at all was housing. So you know, we we deliver education, training, uh, money matters, yeah, all that sort that sort of thing that uh, I don't get involved in on a day to day basis. But at the same time, it was about having sort of a hold, but not control, but a hold on on being able to support 24 hours a day. So housing, you know. What can we do with housing? We we have a site. This is this is one of the sites that we have. And again, presented with the site, go away, you know, see what we can do. And you know, we could very easily look at this from a capital project to get the highest commercial value for these properties. And we could fit ten houses on that site very easily. Um, but that's not what we're about. And we you know, we wanted to deliver something that was different, something that was provocative, you know, it's something that allowed the people within that area, which you know, is classed as a, a poor community, could be inspired by and realise that, you know, that it doesn't have to be sort of cheap, nondescript architecture that, that goes into their place. And we, what we did is we, we looked into you know, a sustainable building type and over the last two years developed a very, very simple design, but very technical at the same time. It's a Code 5, so uh, Code 5 Little Sustainable Homes. And we're delivering five, which to our knowledge is, I, th I think, one of the biggest in the north developments of, of Code 5s. Previous, in, certainly in Yorkshire, what people have been delivering one of Code 5s and showing that yeah, that, that sustainability in houses can be achieved with this housing time. And yeah, this is bang in the middle of our estate and we we wanted to challenge that and we wanted to show that you you can build innovative, sustainable architecture in the heart of a, a, a community. And we you know, again going back to the board, but they fully supported this as an idea. And you know, if if we if we had a board of professionals, they may have said, well, well you know, what what are these going to be worth in the end, or you know, how are we going to use them? What we've done is we've developed that ourselves, and we're going on site with these in April. Um, it's a modular construction, so the houses come in in four separate modules, and they are built once they are on site. They're put together in four days. They are fully mortgageable. Um, they they actually almost almost hit code six on, on a number of levels. It's a passive house system. Um, they purposely don't have any roof because we sat there sort of fiddling around with how what we do with the roof and actually realised that the roof was going in to fit it, fit it into the places for people, non-script housing estate next to it. So we challenged the planners and it was a challenge. They were you know, saying that we needed to you know, standard stuff, match match the roof, match the colours, brick it up, and that's why you know, two years down the line, yeah, they they're ready to go on site. It's we're sort of really looking forward to delivering these houses, um, and yeah, so so that's a sort of small sketch of basically. Yeah, I'm sure sure you're all aware of it, but it's. It's got everything. It's got all the add-ons. It's yeah, and we're, we're sort of really, really excited and looking forward to delivering this project. Um, so at the same time, and it's as important. Um, we we were a contract with national government to deliver empty properties, so the regeneration of the nondescript, you know, empty, yeah, run-down houses. And this is for me as important as. The sort of code five, you know, very different projects. Um, but what we're, you know, what we're doing is we've we sort of lucky enough to have the funding in place to be able to go in and change small pockets of, um, of areas around where we are. And what, it, what 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 we're hoping to do is to sort of go back ten years to when um, 
housing associations were smaller and they had more control. Uh, we, we are now uh, a housing association ourselves and we, yeah, we want to have a, a much tighter approach to how we deal with the tenants. You know, we, we offer enough services to be able to support them through all different aspects of their life. This is a very interesting project, boring something at some, some point, but actually what, what, we've, what we've worked out that we can do is actually deliver interesting projects rather than just the standard going into empty, pro, empty residentials. We've started de developing empty commercials. We, we're, as part of this programme, delivering a house, uh, it's old offices, it was the first building bu built after the war in 1952 in Hull and it's been left, unfortunately, you know, because of the crash, it's been left empty and what is in the heart of the Hull, in Hull, right in city centre and we're delivering 17 um, self-contained high-end flats that will support and underpin you know, our, our social values with you know, commercial income. Um, this will drop this one in. We, you know, that isn't the end. You know, basically, the, the CO5 uh, modules we've developed, and it'd be silly to have them sat on a shelf. The idea of the, the CO5 housing development is it's a proof of concept. Once you know, once we have once we've delivered it, our our, our, you know, our idea is that we pass it on to other development trusts. Um, we help them develop you know, a sub one hundred thousand pound three bed co five house, which is about I think it's about twenty six thousand pounds less than what um, sort of your standard house builders would would charge you for a co five. Um, so. Yeah, we 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 we're taking that now, and we we're committed to it, and we we're, we're looking to deliver about 50 over the next three years through a range of bungalows, which there is a need from our community, there is a need from the city. Um, we're going to be hopefully delivering a bungalow site using the exact same technologies. It's it's three of the modules laid next to each other that equates to a two-bed bungalow. Um, we haven't just plucked that out of the air, that's come as a result from working with our community, commu um, working with our local councillors, our, you know, our ward. It's, it, it's a project that they've come to us and that, that is often how, you know, the best way for us to, to deliver the right type of project. We've, we've identified a need they've identified a need and we've developed um, a building type that suits that need and it's, you know, it, it, it will link in back to the projects, the Co5 housing project. This, this sort of sketch here is, is another project that is going in as part of our three year programme um, that's in, in the city centre and it's using the modules to be formed to make flats because it's in the city centre and space is tight and there is a need for two bed flats in, in the centre of Hull. It's, this is a, sort of an approach that combines sort of the arts agenda, it's the whole city of culture, you know, brilliant for, for Goodwin, brilliant for the city and it's already starting to um, bring different opportunities to the table. And we've jumped on it. You know, there is investment into pockets of very interesting spaces, existing buildings. This 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 one here is the new theatre uh, that's been left to ruin in the centre of Hull. Beautiful building, um, surrounded by you know, beautiful Edwardian properties. And because of the city of culture, the council, the council are now under pressure to do something with this. And so we've said, well, yeah, we, we want to take an approach to that site. This is, you know, this is where we're going to be looking to put the, the housing, the flats, possibly a combination of houses and flats. Um, and yeah, we, we're also looking to jump on board and say, take a, a, a part of what is the old fire station and turn it into a, a dance a dance studio that will 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 link in will link in with the new theatre but all, we'll also link in with our own arts agenda and our own youth youth services.
this, this is a project, again, that um, is using the same formula as the Code 5 houses. Um, it's a mixed-use development. It's, it's literally, it is in the point, it, it, it connects the city centre and the estate in which we work. It's a pivotal point. Um, at the moment stands a falling down old hotel. And again, for the last two years, this has been on our agenda. Um, we will deliver it. Um, not sure when, but we, uh, but we will deliver it. And it's a combination, it's again city centre, so it will it'll combine sort of our community needs, it will combine our commercial agenda, and it will also combine our housing agenda. And again, we you know, originally we, you know, we, we looked at this as a Code 6 development, and that, that, that possibility st is still not out of the window. Um, we, we always look to try and strive to be the best in projects that we deliver. You know, then, as far as architecture goes, they're not always the most beautiful projects. Um, just, you know, going back to the Netto building, it's a single skin Netto building. But we achieve Briam excellent, and you know, I can't say claims that because that was before me. But that that, that signified for me basically that the, 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 it was the right, you know, it was the right organisation to go and work for. And like I said, it wasn't the standards route to leave university, leave, you know, do, do diploma, and then go into a, not an architect. Um, so sustainability is, yeah, obviously it's it's key, it's key and it's on our agenda, and you know, we don't just deliver our sustainability our sustainability agenda through housing. You know, we deliver it through innovation, through um, investing into ideas. We, you know, we possibly we've got time to get onto one of those ideas. Um, so really, that's sort of where I finish. I mean. Um, what I would say is, is that you know, there is there's a very clear line to how you finish university, how you finish architecture, and yeah, I, I'm still in touch with yeah, all of my friends from university, and yeah, they've taken everyone's taken a very different path, and uh, to date, you know, no one no one seems to be doing projects. <coughs> That I, yeah, I was interested in some of the stuff that, that I, yeah, I get the opportunity to do. It's it's definitely a choice to go down this route, and it's not it wouldn't be for everyone. But what yeah, it, it's given me exactly what I want to do, and being yeah, being allowed to uh, sort of demonstrate the ideas and have the support of a development trust behind me. Is that it actually allowed me to yeah, develop projects I don't think I would have been able to have such a hard line of control on. So that's, sort of, that's, that's for me now, for questions as well. Thanks John. I don't know how you want to play it, how these things play out. Is it Q&A? Yeah, um, well, I really just asked me to sum up with a couple of sentences, hey, if that's okay. all right. Yeah. I've never done this before, so this is like important to public speaking kind of exercise just for myself as well. It's the first time I've been John as well. Let's see if I get it, get kind of, I'm, I'm sort of on message, I suppose. So, I mean, um, I just made a couple of notes about sort of a um, couple of really important things, especially within the kind of, uh, with the sort of emphasis on resilience that this sort of lecture, the lecture series has. Um, so as you go right back to the start on what um, Peter said about people, power and agency, the three Latin words, I think that was right, yeah. got, got, got the, wrote the right translations down. Um, and actually those, those three things and kind of really understanding uh, who your clients are and the kind of the client organisation as architects and understanding the opportunities that affords you to kind of create great places and great architecture. I mean, like, like Jonathan said, it's not always about kind of big, shiny new developments. Sometimes the value can really come <coughs> elsewhere, not, not in kind of financial value, value or aesthetic value, but actually value to the community. Um, and again, something that Peter said, uh, that resilience and sustainability in communities is something communities are inherently good at if they're given power. And it's about the kind of brokerage of power and I suppose the sort of um, 
as an architect being an enabler and enabling that agency within the community. So that, that was kind of my summing up and maybe some that will kind of lead on to some questions. So have we got any questions? Yeah. Um, I want to ask Jonathan, it seems like you've got huge potential for kind of creativity uh, and a lot of kind of access to control over these projects. And it seems like a lot of that comes from the fact that you're like a not-for-profit organisation and that does seem to present you with a huge capacity for creativity. But also I was wondering, to what extent does that also limit you? Um, I wouldn't say it doesn't. I, don't, I mean, I wouldn't say it doesn't. Limit um, you know, we I work with architects as well. You know, we we work with a number of firms of architects, with, um, and I don't I don't think it limits me. I think if, if sometimes you know, in having the support of fellow architects on a day to day basis can be a challenge. But I think if you get that in place very early on, which I was lucky to do so with the, you know, other architects who share a similar vision, they don't, you know, they don't do the bottom bottoming out and that the sort of, they may say they do and they you know, they say the right things when looking for work. But when it comes to the architecture, um, they're there as a support network. But I'd say, you know, it, the disadvantage on a day-to-day -day basis is not having a, the support of, you know, architects sat next to you. Right. But, yeah. I think the other thing as well about, about creativity and, and, and the, the limits placed on that, I mean, it, it's almost, I'm kind of, I've learned to have an inherent suspicion of professions that sort of dress themselves up in the clothes of a priesthood and arrive with expertise. It doesn't matter whether they're accountants, bank managers, architects, whatever. I mean, so like the creativity is about solving all community problems. If this series of talks is about resilience and sustainability, if you as architects think you have a particular line on that, you may have. But you haven't got a hook in hell no more than bank managers or accountants or lawyers have been solving the problems that communities like mine face. They're very complex, deep-seated, long-running problems. And actually, unless you take a long-term whole community view of that, which will involve trading power, back to that second word, negotiating power you know, between yourselves as a profession and others, and perhaps more importantly, people who live in that community, and actually the creative thing to do is to actually solve some of these rather complex problems. Rather than turning up, it's a bit like, I don't know, it's, it's like a Clint Eastwood movie, you know. You turn up as the hired gunslinger, you come into town, you shoot the guy, and you leave, you know. Actually, the genuinely creative thing is to arrive and understand the complexity of the problem that that community is facing, and actually start to understand what a long-term solution would be. But I think like, there's an interesting area, because there's, you know, we live in weird times. You know, there's, there's, you know, as the old saying, you know, when, when the going gets weird, the weird get going. I mean, at the moment, there's a big space as the state retreats, and particularly for poor and older communities like ours, as the state retreats. So some of those functions that some of us have always assumed were state function would always be provided. There are actually there's some big open spaces out there. You know? And actually, the local state is the retreat as well. And actually, I think what's interesting is who starts to fill those spaces. And those spaces are about services, but they're also about physical spaces and public realm as well. And as the state retreats, there is an interesting dilemma for people. What do you do with the space that's been abandoned and left behind, both in physical terms and in policy terms? And somewhere that's, you know, that's a challenge, I guess, for you as a, as a generation of potential future architects about how you... And I think mean, the challenge is to redefine you know, what your profession is. And if your profession is still being sought of as, I don't know, your people that go out and build buildings, then actually you're selling yourself short. You know, there is a much more creative role to be played in communities like ours for architects. Next question. Yeah, anyone? Yeah, Adam. yeah, I mean, that last point, I think you just answered a lot of what I was going to ask or say. I think it's... Well, the benefits have been an old look, you know, the question. <laughs> uh, I mean, the first point I want to make is it looks fantastic. And I think 
Jonathan, when you started, you were sort of selling yourself short with it, without saying, all the about apologetics, <coughs> you were designing, you know, the next big goal of commercial projects. Because I think this role that you kind of began to carve out, or give your help to carve out, is something that's really inspirational for us to to actually think that architecture isn't just about making, you know, specifying materials and making kind of <coughs> part decisions. It's about solving complex social problems. Um, but I think my main question was going to be about this retreat of the state and you're an organisation that came up through New Labour, I assume that that whole agenda is part of the reason to grow. And just how are you kind of coping in the time when you're supposed to get on with it by yourself in a big society and then you're in <laughs> Well, it's exactly that point. I think what we're seeing is, is, is new it's almost that abandoned area, you know, both in physical terms and in policy terms. You know, the st- you know, I don't, in 20 years, I don't know when you write social history, but in 20 years, when British social history is rewritten, you know, somewhere it seems to me there was a, there was a period of British social history which started in 1945 and ended in October 2010 when the comprehensive spending review of this government was, was established. And actually, the, the state is in retreat in terms of the social contract that's been around as a consensus for a long time, particularly in the North, for communities that have struggled during the good times, let alone during the bad times. Actually, there is now a huge issue about, well, what is community resilience? Yeah. If there is now no safety net, and in communities like ours, increasingly there isn't. There's benefits legislation changes. There's people are actually made intentionally homeless because they have one bedroom too many. Yeah. Actually, you know, that safety net's moving. So actually, who does build community resilience? Who is it that is the agent that actually has that care for a community? And whether you like it or not, communities will either will either succeed or fail based on their own resilience and based on what it is that they choose to take control of themselves. So I think we live in interesting times. And as a result of that, organisations like, like mine, like ours, actually have a very interesting role to play at the moment. You know, we're having much more constructive conversations with the state than we ever had 10 years ago. Yeah, the fact that yeah, in the last six months, yeah, we've been offered a fire station, we've been offered a golf course, we've got a bunch of people coming next week from the Ministry of Defence who want to know if we're interested in an air base in Lincolnshire. Yeah, as the state retreats, yeah, the game changes. And actually creativity is about how you respond to that changing game and changing rules. So I think there's, there's some magnificent opportunities. Any more questions? Got time for a couple more. Jess, can see your hand moving. You want to go? Um, I was just wondering if, with this sort of state retreating, um, if you are in a position to respond quite well to that, uh, do you think that's sort of problematic for other communities that don't have quite the same potential and that, I don't know, perhaps to some extent you're allowing that retreat because you're sort of an example of a community that can cope really well, whereas others perhaps can't. Yeah, I... I <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. I'm not usually camera shot. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, we... Yeah, there is already discussion goes on in government about the idea of yeah, abandoning communities. That actually there are some communities that are actually service and requirements. Yeah. What, yeah, Hull would be a good example. If Hull wasn't there, you wouldn't build it. Hull is there because there used to be fish in the North Sea. There is no longer any fish in the North Sea, therefore Hull has actually no reason to exist. At the moment, Hull is, is being like Dorothy, it's clicking its heels and hoping that there will be a major investment from Siemens because there might not be fish in the North Sea, but there's wind. So there is potentially a decision to be made about hundreds of millions of pounds worth of investment. And if that goes the wrong way, then Hull actually has no purpose. It is simply 250,000 people at the edge of the empire with no real reason to be there anymore. And that actually becomes challenging. That becomes challenging about how we define community and what the purpose of community is. I think we'll be all right. But I think there are lots of other communities that won't be. And that's a challenge. 
Yeah. If what you do as professionals is deal with people and spaces, and people and spaces are being abandoned, then actually what's your purpose in it all? Yeah, um, I was just interested to know um, in this empty space as you were talking about, um, is there actually a battle between your type of organisation and then organisations that do want to make profit, that do want to maybe exploit that space? Is there, you know, what kind of, I don't know. Mm. We're talking about sort of housing and the only hills were going and people bought whole streets. Oh, well, yeah, 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 yeah. There it is. Mm. Um, well, yeah, as Peter says, you know, the hall isn't the most desirable place for investment. And although there are, yeah, there are the big investors out there, but what, what we can offer is, is more than the delivery of a project. And we can offer, you know, a different view of how, how that project would be delivered, and it, that ticks a lot of, lot of boxes for a lot of people. You know. Hull doesn't have, at the moment, have a big investing mafia. If Siemens came in, then yeah, the investors would be interested again. What, what we what we can offer, and you know, there is a project on the table at the moment where you know, someone's got a project, they're looking for finance, they came to us. We. We, yeah, it wasn't something that we thought about in the first instance. And um, we went away and worked out how, you know, how we would, first, first, what we would do with that building. Money comes, money comes next, yeah. What we would do with that building, how we would make that building work. And then we go and think about the money. And at the same time, you know, this, this idea is being banded around to private investors. The private investors are coming up with, you know, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll build you this, and it's going to cost you X. And what, what we actually, you know, we bring to the table more than that building. We bring more to the table than just delivering a building in an empty space. You know, we, we bring an approach that is going to benefit the city, you know, the local people, and yeah. The, that's something that you know, we're in a lucky position that we can you know, we can do do so. So sort of another another element is yeah, at the moment we're doing the empty homes program, and the reason that Hull has such a problem with empty properties is because ten years ago you know houses in Hull being sold for <coughs> ten, twenty, thirty thousand pounds at an auction in London, and you know, I've met four or five guys from London who bought up 100 properties in Hull on the basis that in 10 years time they'll all be worth you know, X, X. Some of them, they, they got them let out, some of them they weren't you know, too interested about what really happened to them because they were an asset that they were going to be able to capitalise on in 10, 15 years time. And what's actually happened is the market has, you know, at, at best they stagnant and they're now in negative equity. And yeah, that's why we're being able to be pretty successful with our program because we've you know we've got national national government money, we've got some of our own money, and we're able to start fixing that problem because on every street in Hull, but in where we're working, there are three or four empty properties that have been bought up using that model that's bringing down that neighbourhood, and you know what we do and what we're doing as part of this program although yeah at the moment it's the empty homes program but we're already looking at other opportunities to continue delivering the empty homes program through different funding through different models of supported housing for kids leaving care ex-military you know that sort of thing and what what our aim is is to go into those streets and to acquire those four properties that are either still with the investor, the greedy investor in London, or they're with the greedy banks because that greedy investor's gone bankrupt, and go in and you know and take those properties. So I can think of yeah a, a few cases where we're paying more for those properties than is the market value you know for an empty rundown property. Because that's not what we're what we're not here to capitalise. You know, yes, we need. You know, it's nice to have empty property, well, new, newly refurbished properties on our balance sheet. We're paying more than the you know, the value of those properties because 
what we what we intend to do is to go and change that neighbourhood. Okay? And it's not just our neighbourhood. Okay? We 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 have a line drawn around one estate. We have, I think we've got one house out of our thirty properties that we've acquired so far in the programme on our estate. Actually, that's because they don't come up for sale in our estate because it's becoming a more desirable place to live you know, year year by year. Um, we're we're in other we're in other communities, you know, other communities where we don't operate on a day to day basis. They can they they use our services possibly, but it's our, our smaller neighbouring communities that we're aiming to change. You know, one off streets. You know, we can't do more, but we can go and continue to run this program, find the money from you know different areas. And the money's out there. The money's out there. If we can deliver a, a scheme, which we are doing, that is successful and it's got outputs, because at the end of the day, it's the outputs that are written down on pieces of paper and then passed on. Yeah, and we think we can do that. And so, to, going back to your question, yeah, yeah, there are people who are still wanting to invest in pool, but yeah. They're, they're greedy. You know, the, the, today, I'm, you know, I haven't come across anyone that's that gets it, and you know what we hopefully do. Yeah. I mean, the ability not to be driven by shareholder value actually is a quite a liberating thing. You yeah. know, you can actually decide what it is that's important, and actually, if you know, a beneficial social outcome is important, then all you have to do is make sure it wipes its face over 25 years. And, and my board of directors are comfortable with that. They're not in it uh, to to make a lot of money. So that changes changes the balance of forces in the game. You know, so as as you know, as speculative investors leave town, actually once again they leave behind a new sort of space, and that's a space to look at property in a different way, not as a long term commercial investment, but as a long term stake in a community. I think we've got time for one more question, if anybody's got one. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, like, as you expand kind of beyond the geographical boundaries of your like, initial neighbourhood, um, how do you deal with engaging with those communities? And do you, like you said, you valued like, having a draw that was all the people who lived there? Yeah. And I wonder if you were working to set up boards in those communities or yeah. that type of thing? It was, I mean, that, that was a really difficult question that the organisation faced. About 10 years ago, we, we, about 10 years ago, for the first time, we had the opportunity to move outside of our immediate geography. And the government uh, was running a programme called the Showstop programme, which was uh, a government programme that provided uh, nursery and support for young families, kids under the age of five and families with kids under the age of five. And previously, the local authority, the city council said, well, we do that, we do that, we do that. And there was a show style program announced for a, a, a piece of geography that included us. So we said, we'll do that. And we were told, no, 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 it's not for you, it's for the state to deliver. And we argued and argued and argued. Then in the end, they said, okay, but it's not just your geography, it's a much bigger piece of geography. And actually, yeah, as is the case, I don't know whether you do you all do, does that, do they do philosophy? Is anybody familiar with Occam's Razor? No? Occam's razor is a, is a philosophical concept which, which boiled down says that when all the complexity has been evaporated, it's the simplest explanation which is frequently the truth. And actually, the simplest explanation for us operating off our estate is that we operate in exactly the same way we do on our estate. So if we operate, so we deliver a children's centre and a nursery in some other community, we simply set up a committee to manage that function. And on that committee is 50% of the people who use that facility and live in that community. And it works perfectly well. And it isn't any more complicated than that. And actually, if you say to people that you know, we're in your community, but we're in it with your consent and your, and your permission, then actually, by and large, that works pretty effectively. Right, I think that, that wraps up the questions for this week. But let's give uh, Peter and Jonathan another round of applause. Please.